welcome to the Inside Track on Real Estate with the Decker team. And I'm Yetta Decker. And I'm Ken Decker. My sidekick, most of the time. <laughs> yeah, that means she kicks me in the side. It does. <laughs> anyway, and there is more on the Decker team. They're just not all crammed into the studio today. So you're going to get to hear from Ken and I. And we want to share with you the answer to questions that we get asked repeatedly. Yeah. Some of them not repeatedly, but some I'd of them. I'd say all of them. <laughs> okay. I've heard them all more than once or twice right. over the last 25 years. Okay. So here we go. Okay. So this show is going to be all over the place in terms of the topic. It is real estate related, and that is the commonality. Great. Right? So first question I have from a listener and follower of the Inside Track on Real Estate is I heard about seminars on how to invest in real estate with zero down, zero percent, no money, mm -hmm. and that makes tons of money. Okay. So should I go to one of those seminars and should I buy their program? That's a great question. It is. Uh, first of all, zero down on investment properties doesn't exist in, in Canada. Okay. So a lot of those programs are coming up from the States. They're on U.S. channels or, or they're a U.S. person coming to Canada to, to teach on this. And fine to go to the free seminar. But what I've heard is... Because you'll get some information. You might we, get some we've information. We've been to some. There's sure. usually a few good tidbits sure. there. Even I put on a free seminar, which yes, is actually do. phenomenal information. You put on a workshop. A workshop. And I do not advertise buy with nothing down. Right. I don't advertise that. Uh, and that's one of the differentiating features. The other thing is, once you get there to their free seminar, what they want to do is sell you a three or four day course for three, four, five thousand dollars or a system, you know, a mail order system, you order their system. And the, the thing that really makes me upset is sometimes they teach people how to get their visa limits increased or whatever to be able to pay for this system. And, and then the system's really worthless. Right. They, there are a lot of hype and excitement about the system, but then it's really not worth anything in Ontario or Or very Ottawa. little. Very, very little. And so what they've actually done is they've decreased the person's ability to buy an investment property because now they have more debt because they increased their visa payment to put this thing on visa. So they're kind of uh, taking advantage of those that want are in a, maybe a tough spot and want to get out of that tough spot. And really it's going further in debt is not the way to get out of a tough financial spot. Right, not to buy a program to mm -hmm. help you... Try to potentially buy. try to buy yeah. something. And if this system works so well, why are they selling the system? Why aren't they just going out and buying all the real estate with nothing down and making bazillions of dollars and instead of trying to sell a product to unsuspecting clients? Right. And the interesting thing with these programs is there is some value that can come out of some of them. Yeah. Right? There is. There is some good information that's available there. Mm -hmm. The question, I guess, is what's the cost of that information? And do you have access to that money without borrowing it? And why is there a cost to the information would be another question. Yeah. And um, also, is that information relevant to the marketplace that you're looking at investing in? Right. If you're thinking of maybe investing somewhere in the States, uh, maybe it might work. That's right. And so we do have a question. I did look through these quickly, and there is another question that's coming up down the road that talks about, should I buy in my city? So maybe I'll ask you that now. Should I buy in the city I live in if I'm thinking of investing? Or ought I to buy in a city that I don't live in? Because maybe there's better returns there, whether it's in Canada or whether it's in the States or even elsewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. It really is. And it, and it kind of has multiple answers. Yeah, it does. And one of the things that you've got to take into consideration, especially if you're buying a property in the U.S., because there was, a, let's talk about that for a moment, because there was a lot of talk about, oh, the U.S. dollar, or the, the U.S. market is so depressed, and uh, the Canadian dollar was strong. That was about a year, year and a half ago. And so why not buy in the U.S.? And it's a good question. And, and yes, there were good values there, and yes, the Canadian dollar was strong and it's weaker now, or at least the U.S. dollar is stronger. And to me, there's absolutely no reason why the U.S. dollar is strong. Okay, right let's now. not get into a financial conversation. <laughs> no, but this is, the this, this is important thing. because what happens is when you yeah. buy 
real estate and you're buying something leveraged, so you're putting 20% down on it, let's say, okay, and you buy a property at a couple hundred thousand dollars. Now, suddenly the exchange rate changes by 10 cents on a dollar. Now, you've got to multiply that by your your uh, borrowing factor. So if you borrowed 80%, that's a five times factor. 20% down, five times that is the value of the product. It goes down 10 cents on a dollar. You've got to multiply that by five times. So now you've lost 50 cents on the dollar. Why do you have to multiply? You even lost me on that calculation. Because, because you're, you're buying a $200,000 property, you're putting $40,000 down. Right, but you're borrowing two hundred thousand. You have a two hundred thousand dollar property. You said two hundred thousand dollar property. Mm -hmm. You're putting forty thousand down. Right. So you're borrowing a hundred and sixty. That's right. Okay. So let's say you keep that property for twenty years. Okay. And you paid it totally off. Okay. It's worth two hundred thousand dollars, but our dollar's gotten stronger. Their dollar's gotten weaker. You mean it's worth? Oh, it's still worth two hundred. Hasn't let's gone just, up your, uh, just for yeah. argument's for sake. For argument's sake, let's say okay. it's still two hundred thousand. Well, let's say it's three hundred. Can we not have some fun with this? Sure, three hundred thousand. It's twenty years later. It better be worth at least a hundred thousand sure. more. Three hundred thousand, okay. and the dollar's gone down ten cents compared to our dollar. Right now, the reverse could happen. It could go the other way as well. But let's say it goes down ten percent. That's thirty thousand dollars on our initial investment of forty thousand dollars. We've lost. 75% of our investment because of the exchange rate. Okay. So I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying be careful because you throw in another layer of complexity and that is the exchange rate from one currency to another. The other thing is most people, if you're going to retire in the US, great because maybe you buy the house that you're going to rent for 20 years and you're going to go retire in it. It's not going to really matter because you're, you're spending in those in currencies when you live down there. But when you've got to bring the money back to Canada, there could be a plus or a minus factor based on the currency. And same thing, that's why I like buying locally. I like buying in Canadian dollars because I know that my retirement dollars are going to be Canadian dollars. And right. I don't have to worry about any kind of a, a currency change. Okay. Okay. So yep. it just adds a layer of complexity. The other thing that adds a layer of complexity with buying out of, out of country is taxes. Uh, there's tax treaties between the U.S. and Canada, so fair taxes. But you still, you might have to do a U.S. tax return and a Canadian tax return. So it adds another layer of complexity that you don't have if you're buying in Canada. Canada. Okay. Okay, does that help? The third issue, and I said this was a very complex, small question. It was a small a question, big answer. Complex answer, answer. Okay. yes. The, the third thing is, how do I maintain that property? How do I make sure I've got the right tenants? Uh, can I find a, a great property manager in that locality? Because I'm not there. Right. And, it, and being an absentee landlord is one of the worst things possible. It's, well, it's not that bad. Because here's, here's what well, I've learned. Okay. As long as you have a good team on your side in that city. A great team. Okay, a great team. Forget the word good. Let's move to great. Yes. Okay, because... You good is the enemy have, of great. You have to have a great management team on site. And real estate agent and lawyer mm -hmm. and maintenance guy, just everybody that's going to do, or gal, everybody that's going to do the work relative yep. to that property. So I guess the caution then is if you're going to be an absentee landlord, make sure you have a manager who's not absentee. Right. Because a lot of the properties that I've seen that have become grow houses are rentals. People have rented them to somebody. And then they've gone to Europe and lived there for two years or whatever and come back. They didn't have a property manager. Nobody going in to check the property every month or two. Because if someone's going in to check the, you know, change filters, check smoke alarm batteries, check caulking, make sure the caulking around the tub's good. And you're going in every month to six weeks. To maintain a property. To maintain which a property. Which is appropriate. You can't grow a crop, <laughs> a, a, a marijuana crop in that amount of time. So no one's going to buy a, a rent a house like that for a grow up. Right. And a grow up will kill your investment in a, in a rental property, like just destroy your, your, uh, your level of equity in it. Yeah, it will. 
Okay. Oh, did that help? I think it did. <laughs> that was an answer. So let's stay on this sort of that the investing. An that was an answer, all right. <laughs> so if you have more questions or you need clarity, the number is 613-860-4663. 613-860-4663. And you want to ask for either Ken Decker or Ryan Decker. They're both incredibly passionate about the whole investing in real estate. Candace St. Louis, who was Decker, as well as myself, yet a Decker. We have the basic answers around investing. However, it is their passion zone. Ryan's got a product that he's out there that he's um, helping other real estate agents actually with to help their clients. He's helping his clients with it around the investing ratios and all of that. So we're not even going to touch on that aspect of it today. However, if you have questions at all, whether it's locally, abroad, in the States, or internationally, these are the guys to call, 613-860-4663. And if you get a hold of Candace or I, we'll tell you to talk to Ryan or Ken. So there you go. Thanks a lot. <laughs> you're, well, you're good at it. There you go. We want expertise where the expertise is. So in relation to investing and buying a piece of real estate, and I have another question here that's kind of related. It's about the rent-to-own option. Yes. So a rent-to-own is simply a property that you're going to purchase now, mm -hmm. and you're not going to actually own it for a year or two years or three years. Okay. Right? You're going to make a commitment to purchase it. So yeah. the question is, can I raise the price if I'm doing a rent to own and I'm the seller and give the down payment to the buyer as they're renting and they don't have the funds actually for a down payment? Okay. So I'm going to hit on that. I'd also like to just explain the rent or own a little bit and why they exist. As the market gets tougher, in other words, there's more houses for sale. It's sometimes harder for sellers to sell their house. And so they may choose to offer it up for rent to own. And a rent to own is really designed for somebody who's presently renting, uh, wants to buy, but maybe their credit rating's not quite clean enough. There's some bruises on it. Or maybe they haven't been in their place of employment long enough. Right. Or, or maybe, maybe they're, they're a new immigrant, new immigrant to yeah. Canada. Mm -hmm. Or there's some reason that today their ability to actually get a mortgage right. is hindered. Right. And maybe in, they've gone through a divorce and, they're, and they're settled, uh, their, um, their package or their settlement is not defined yet. Right. And so no lender wants to lend to them because they don't know what, how much either they're getting from a spousal support or child support area or they don't know how much you have to pay. Right. So, the, so getting a mortgage then is really tough in that right. transition. So period. there's a lot of transitional times where mm -hmm. rent to own may make a good possibility because how it fills the gap is it means you don't have to move again. If yes. you found the property as a person looking to rent mm -hmm. and or own, if you could find the property today, move in and simply wait to exchange funds for the down payment and actually taking title, at which time you can get a mortgage, yeah. it may make a lot of sense. Now, these, these programs typically only work well if they're structured really, really well. And usually what happens is, like you said, they're going to they're gonna buy the property now, but they don't close on it for maybe two years but they have an interim occupancy period where they can actually live in the house for those two years. They're paying an occupancy fee rather than rent. It's really an occupancy fee, like a pre-occupancy pre fee. And the reason we changed that terminology, and it is a different way of living in the house, is because if we call it rent, now the Tenant Protection Act is in place. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to be the owner, you're not actually a tenant even That's though right. you are you are having an you are an occupant and you have an occupancy so, period so you have different rights right. both the both the seller and the buyer have different rights under this contract Correct. and then they would under the tenant protection act exactly now the the thing that's interesting is you would pay market rent plus an extra amount which is what would be going to your down payment account basically so when you go to close, you've accumulated some extra down payment. 
Right. So if market rent is fifteen hundred dollars, mm -hmm. you might write a check every month for two thousand right. dollars, and probably in two separate checks, just because yeah. it's easier. Yeah, so one check is five. for five hundred, and the other check is for fifteen hundred. One becomes rent and is dealt with accordingly, mm -hmm. both from the the owner's perspective as well as you as the buyer. Right. And then the other five hundred is put into a separate account or kept segregated. It's accounted for differently. Accounted for differently is probably the mm -hmm. right way to say it. And that becomes, you do that for even 12 months, you've now got, what, $6,000. You do it for two years, you now have $12,000 towards your, toward down, your payment. down payment. Yeah. And, and the yeah. banks will look at that yeah. and they'll understand it if it's drawn up properly. If it's drawn up wrong mm. and if it wasn't market rent that you were charging, the banks will not allow it. And in the question that was poised was, can I basically increase the price? So let's say the house is worth 200000 Can I increase the price to two twenty, and basically gift the buyer their 10% down, you know, $22,000 or whatever? Uh, basically, it's mortgage, mortgage fraud. Right. Not basically. It is mortgage fraud. It is fraud. mortgage fraud. Yeah, that's basically. <laughs> it is mortgage fraud and is against the law because what you've done is you've overinflated the value of the house and the buyer has not really gotten their down payment. And so what the bank really wants to see in a rent to own is that the renter has been able to pay their rent plus put money aside every month for the down payment, just like most people would. They're going to save their down payment, whether that's 5%, 10%, 20%, whatever it is, they're going to save that before they buy. Right. And that's what they're looking for. Okay. So if you're just joining us now on the Inside Track on Real Estate with the Decker team, we are exploring answers to great questions that um, buyers and sellers have asked us. Mm -hmm. So if you want to look specifically at the whole rental aspect, it seems that we were able to batch those questions a little bit in the front part. And now we're going to talk about some of the other things. And as far as real estate investing goes, we do have an amazing workshop that is offered monthly. It is the second... Thursday mm -hmm. of every month and Ken often do, facilitates the workshop as well as our son Ryan and we have guests that come and join us there as mm -hmm. well. Quite often your very own Lynn Fraser will That's be there. That's right from the Financial Fitness Show. Mm -hmm. She will be there as well answering the questions around real estate investing and it's a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. It's probably the longest of all the workshops that we facilitate because there's the most detailed information and we're covering the largest spectrum probably. Yeah, it really could be a two-day workshop. It could be a two-day. So <laughs> but we cram it into two and a half hours. <laughs> yeah, which is crazy. <laughs> anyway, you'll walk away with your head spinning a little bit. And if you already own a couple investment properties, you'll still find there'll be nuances there. There'll be fine-tuning. There'll be uh, some of the conversation because there's other investors in the room with you. Some of I their guarantee questions. guarantee they'll get a golden nugget. Yeah, or two. Or their money back. Okay. And since it's free, it's really easy to give your money back. <laughs> However, that is something that will really help you. If the first part of the show really intrigued you. You'll want to attend that. And all you have to do there, again, the same number I gave you earlier, 613-860-HOME or 613-860-4663 or info at DeckerTeam.com. And that's Decker, double K, no C. So on to more questions. Here we go. Okay. I'm selling a house and all the conditions have been met. Now, two weeks before closing, the buyer wants to have, or their institution wants to have, an appraisal. Do I have to let them in? That's question one. <laughs> yes. In question two, what if the appraisal is lower than the agreed upon purchase price? Okay, this is a fantastic question. And it happens more often than not, actually. That the appraisal is done after, after removal of conditions. Yes, especially for people that are putting 20% or more down. Right. Because what happens is uh, CMHC or Genworth or one of those companies that insure a mortgage if you're a high ratio mortgage, so you're putting only 5 or 10 or 15% down, uh, they do kind of an online appraisal at the time. And of, sometimes they'll even do a physical appraisal yeah, at that time. At the time of approval. Right. Whereas your bank may not, because they see you've got 20% down, 
they're or gonna, 30. They're going to basically look at the house, see if it's an MLS house, a house that was listed by a real estate agent, because then they know it's fairly close. To market value. Typically, yep. Mm -hmm. And then they're also going to do, you know, your credit checks and all that, make sure the person qualifies. Then they're going to give you your approval. And so now you... And you your come approval, smiling to FYI, your realtor. at that point is still conditional on appraisal generally. Yes, yes. But so you're going to come can. with that approval. And it might even be conditional on providing uh, income, statement income or... statements, uh, check stubs from, from your paychecks, uh, things like that. Or an employment letter. Yep. Uh, now, what happens is in the case of the appraisal happening, you know, a week or two before closing, it's scary for the seller. I understand where the seller's coming from. And if they call their lawyer, their lawyer will probably say, don't let him in. Well, except then what he's going to say in the second breath yes. is if you don't let him in, you risk the property not closing. So yeah, because they can't get their financing. Right. So the, the because, bank wants this. Right, because it's a requirement for the buyer. So although it's the buyer's problem, it quickly becomes the seller's problem if they don't accommodate. Exactly. Even if the contract hasn't been written accordingly. Now, we mm -hmm. do happen to write our contracts when we're writing them for our buyer that simply states the appraisal may happen before or after the removal of conditions. Yes, and, and that's and something the we've seller been, will allow access. Right, and that's something we've been doing for many, many years now mm -hmm. because when this whole because it used to be that the appraisals were pretty much always done prior to removal of conditions, mm -hmm. and then things shifted in our industry, and that wasn't the case anymore. So the first few were very nobody knew how to deal with them. Yeah, and so we've dealt with it in advance of it becoming mm -hmm. an issue. However, it's still scary. Now, the second part of that question yeah. is also very wise. Because if it does come in lower, by the way, it will never come above. Because Seldom. The appraiser, the appraiser is really being asked by the lending institution to verify that the price you purchased at is market value. Right. So they're not going to come in and say, oh, yeah, you actually bought it 100 grand under market value or whatever. Even so, if you did. Even if you did. Usually it's going to come in at your purchase price. Now, if they can't justify that purchase price... Based on statistics based and based recent on data. Recent sales, then it's going to come in lower. And let's say it comes in $10,000 lower. Well, the bank may require you to bring more down payment money to the table. Like if you were exactly 20% down, they might say, no, we want more down because we're going to only lend on the value that is 10,000 less. So we need that extra 10,000 in down payment. Or now that's fine if you can get it or if you can do a, a line of credit or something your credit you allows for that. Or you have extra money in your bank. Or you got extra money. That's fine. But it can be a hiccup and it can be tricky. And sometimes we have to get a second appraisal because sometimes we've had cases where the appraiser was appraising in a country property and they're not used to country properties, and we had to get an appraisal company that does do country property, and it came in okay. And, and sometimes we even have to switch lending institutions because that. the lender won't take the other person's appraisal. So it gets down to really it, And the challenge is stuff. very little does the financial institution and or the mortgage broker have a lot to say about who can appraise the property now. It goes out more as a blanket um, request for an appraisal and that's why sometimes you'll get folks in the properties that really don't have a lot of first-hand knowledge mm -hmm. right whereas it used to be we could direct yeah, and we not, can't not anymore. anymore because they're feeling that that's not an arm's length mm -hmm. or an unbiased um, perspective so that creates a little bit of complexity having said all that around appraisals though most of the time it is hiccup free yeah most of the time and this question just sort of allows us to explore what happens if. And it is one of those areas of potential turbulence when you're working to sell a home. Mm -hmm. Could happen. And so if you're joining us on the Inside Track now, you've missed great segment on <laughs> questions that folks ask us. And I want to talk to you about opportunity because really I think a lot of these questions are about opportunities. Sure. Opportunities to cover things right, opportunities about investments, opportunities to make sure that we don't have problems. It's just mm -hmm. a good thing. And so I'm going to say we've got opportunity, 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 and they all have location, location, location. You know what that is? What? That's three knocks. Knock three times. 
Perfect. Remember that song? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never know where he's going to go with something. I'm always a little nervous. Opportunity folks. knocks three times. Let's okay. hear about your three opportunities. Okay. There are great real estate opportunities, one in the West End, one in the South End. Actually, I can maybe squeeze in a the fourth. No, no. Oh, I can only do three? Okay. So we have an amazing <laughs> opportunity in Canada, which is in the starter end of the price point of the market. And the amazing thing about it, it is townhouse priced, and yet it's a single family home. Okay. $250,000. That's almost below townhouse price. I know. Yeah. So... If you have any interest in being in the uh, West End, just off outside of Canada, just outside Morgan's Grant, 250000 will buy you a three-bedroom, single-family home, century-style home. Yeah, 1860 or something like I think it's like 1860 that. or 1869. Yeah, so if you love older homes. Charm, character. Charm, character. And it's had a newer kitchen put in, so it's not all... Yeah, newer bathroom, yep. newer windows, furnaces and all that old. Yeah. But if you like stone foundation and all that goes with that, this might be a house for you. Yeah. And it's very affordable. Yeah, so that's an awesome opportunity and well located. I mean, it's just off um, March Road and um, the Dunrobin Road there. Yeah. And so conveniently located close to all the amenities that Canada has to offer. And then another great opportunity is in Manatick. Slightly different price point. It is five hundred and. $50,000, which is spectacular. It is a four-bedroom, two-story, completely renovated up and down in 2011. A great landscaping, nice professionally done on the exterior at the front and the back deck, as well as patio, as well as porch, walkway. Yep. And it is a stone throw from Tim Hortons. Yeah, so if you are one of these people that needs to wake up with a coffee... You can just walk across the street in your pajamas, grab your coffee, and walk back. And then get in the car and <laughs> make one turn and get into work. Yeah. It's amazing. That's just outside Manatick. And then another awesome opportunity is located in Greeley. So we'll move a little bit further east, I guess. Yep. And it is a single-family home. Again, gorgeous porch, except entirely different than the one I just spoke about. $435,000. Or oh my a, goodness. I know. And the kitchen was installed in 2014. So it has large main floor family room off the eating area, off the kitchen, so that nice across the whole back. Fence yard. How often do we see a fence yard in Greeley on a half acre? Not that often. Very seldom. Very private. Lots of mature trees. Picturesque. Family oriented. The street only has the traffic from the people living on the street. If you yeah, want to nice visit, person. I suppose you could yeah. drive on it. Yeah. But otherwise, amazing opportunity. So for any of those or any other of your real estate needs, call us. 613-860-4663. And we're glad you joined us on the Inside Track on Real Estate. And if you have questions for us, get them to us and we'll answer them on another show. Thank you so much. Have a great day.